Okay, I'm glad everybody is here. Those are online. We we'll welcome you to our study this evening. We'll prepare ourselves in our usual way by having a few moments of silent prayer. And during that time, we have the opportunity to name privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins. I forgot to tell you the date. So today is June the 22nd, 2021. Uh, by the way, the reason I give the date is because when people are looking for a particular message and they know the date, all they have to do is just listen for a few seconds. They'll get the, the date and they'll be able to tell if they have the right one or not. Anyway, that's why I give the date each time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your faithfulness. You are utterly faithful. Your grace is always pursuing us. It's impossible for you to lie, and we love you, and we love your phenomenal promises. They are what give us strength and hope and confidence and stability and all the things that people want. Peace of God is there in this book. So we pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate on it this evening so that we can rightly divide the word of truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to start tonight in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. I'm going back and review a little bit to pick up a little here, a little bit there, because as time passes, it's easy for us to forget. We still have a gizmo back there that's not working, and so you're not getting the notes off of my computer, but off here. And so I'm going to go in and out of having this this screen on. When I have verses that you need to see and so forth, I'm going to turn it on. But I'm going to be turning it off more than I normally would because I think that helps... Uh, uh, Cindy, because she's, um, yeah, she she can only see the top half, and so I don't want to have any distractions, so sometimes I'm going to turn it off and I'll turn it back on, and that's why we're doing it that way until we get to our new gizmo. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, most people have memorized this verse. It's a very short verse, very powerful verse. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I have a little nomenclature here. A sinned, sinned is the Greek word hamartia, and this is a verb, it's the aorist active indicative, which means for we all have sinned in a point in time. And the aorist tense, I mean the active voice, means we are the ones that are responsible for our sins. And the indicative mood means it's a mood of reality. It's not just a potential. We all have sin. And I think most rational people, well, just all rational people will acknowledge that. They know that that's true and fall short of the glory of God. Now, some people sin more than others, and some sins are worse than other sins, but they all fall, out, uh, fall into the category of sin. God hates sin. He will not tolerate sin. And that's why his so great plan of salvation is so marvelous because he is the only one that could take care of the sin problem and still remain faithful to his perfect attributes. It took tremendous love and humility in order to come up with a plan like that, much less to be able to facilitate it. The Bible demonstrates to us when we are at our worst, which is when we're sinning, and also when we are our, at our best, which is when we are doing good works, doing something good. But even when we're doing the best and the most that we can, we still fall far short of God's glory. And 
And of course, in our verse, it says we, we do that. However, it is uh, to our benefit that we do fall short of God's glory because when we fall short of God's glory, we come unto under what God's what? Grace. We are all helpless in saving ourselves, but we're not hopeless. Our hope is in the Lord. We sing a song that's titled that. See, God's condemnation always precedes salvation. And he did the most for us when we were born by condemning us from birth, which means immediately we fell under his grace because the condemnation was there, and that is always preceded by his, or followed by his grace. So God's attributes and his character compel him to meet a high standard. In fact, it's a perfect standard. It's a standard we cannot meet on our own. And that means that we have to humble ourselves and recognize that God's gracious offer of redemption through Jesus Christ on the cross is the only hope that we have. There is none other. And that's the way it should be. That's the way that God designed it. So on the cross, Jesus Christ died and took our punishment. And what was our punishment? Anybody know? Separation from God. Spiritual death. Forever. And God is always the one that takes the initiative in order to save us. You, when you think of Adam and the woman after they sinned, of course, they went and hid and got the fig tree going and all that, but God was the one that was pursuing them. He says, Adam, where are you? And he didn't only mean, where are you, like he couldn't find me. Of course, he knew where he was. Where are you now? I told you what was going to happen if you ate of the forbidden fruit. Now, look now where you are. And then they started playing past the buck. Now, the Greek word for fallen short is Husterio. Excuse me, I didn't pronounce that right. Hu, hu, stereo. That's H U. I'll show it to you here. It's H U S T E R E O. Pronounced hu. What, what, Cindy? Okay. Pronounced hu stereo. And it's a present passive indicative. It means to fall, uh, fail in some measure, to attain some state or condition, to fail, to attain, to lack, to be in need. Now, the morphology of ver this verb is interesting. That's why I put it out on its own here. The present tense means we continue to fall short, and we will continue to fall short because we are fallen creatures and we have an old sin nature. The passive voice means to receive this fallen condition and the indicative mood means it's not only a potential but a reality. And it's the middle one, that passive voice, that really gets you. Let's look at the verse and we'll look at it in the passive voice. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Fall short. Let's go back down to where we were. Is a present tense. We get passive voice indicative mood. Passive voice. What does the passive voice mean? It says that we fall short, right? But we didn't, we didn't commit an action that caused us to fall short. We're not condemned for our sin is another way of putting it. We received that falling short. We receive this condemnation. And I bet there's not one in a thousand churches that are taught how important that is. Because most people think that they are, well, first of all, they fall short because of themselves, because of what mainly their sins. 
And you have millions, if not billions, of people who think, well, if, if I'm going to go to the good place, if I'm going to go uh, to paradise, then I have to do something about my sins. And they're trying to clean up aisle seven with their sins. But they, what they don't recognize is they have never been held accountable for their sins. In Romans chapter 5, we find out that we are all condemned for Adam's sin. I have some, let me just scroll down where you can see it. Here it is right here. Romans chapter 5, verse 18 through 19. By the way, how many people do you know that if you ask them, does God condemn you for your own sins? For your sins? Are you condemned for your sins? How many of them would say, well, no. We're condemned for Adam's sin. How many would know that? And you have all these people that are trying to make up for their sins, and God isn't even holding them accountable to begin with. And they don't know it. You see, you can be really off course by what you don't know. So here's Romans 5, 18 and 19. So then, as through one transgression, there resulted the condemnation to all men. And of course, we know that one, that one transgression was when Adam ate of the forbidden fruit. That's when he died. He died spiritually. And that is the punishment for sinning against God. Of course, he lived on to be over 900 years, but he died right then because God told him, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And he died spiritually right away. So as to one transgression, there resulted condemnation to who? All men. Why? Because God condemned all men for Adam's sins. Adam was the federal head of the human race. And so he was responsible for all of us. And when he fail, we all fail. Then it says, even through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. Who is that talking about? Jesus Christ on the cross. One act of sin put everybody under the gun. Everybody was condemned for Adam's sin. But on the other side, you have one man, Jesus Christ, according to that, this, his act on the cross, his going to the cross, resulted in justification of life to all men. Notice you have here condemnation to all men, and here you have justification. Justification of life to all men. That doesn't mean that, that all men were saved when Jesus Christ went to the cross and paid for our sins, the sins of the world. But it means they are savable. They have a potential. And the one potential is to have faith in Christ. They're either going to believe in themselves or some other person or some other God or something. And the one condition is that they put their faith alone in Christ alone. So he died for the sins of all mankind. Now, it even gets worse when you're talking to someone and you would ask them, why do people go to hell? Why are they unsaved? How many of them, what, let me put it, what percentage-wise would say uh, they go to hell for their sins? What percentage? 98, 99, something like that? They don't know this, and yet it's very clear. Nobody goes to hell for their sins because, first of all, they're not condemned for their sins. They're condemned for Adam's sin. And as soon as they're born and they're condemned for Adam's sin, they fall under God's grace. And that means the cross is available to them. All they have to do is believe in it. So people, all people that wind up in hell can't blame it on God. And they're not even going to hell because of their own sins. Why are they going to hell? Because they reject the cross. 
Jesus Christ paid for the sins of the world. Look at right here. All men, all men. This is not some here and some there or whatever. This covers the whole. And, and why is it so important that Jesus Christ paid for the sins of all mankind? <coughs> <coughs> Because that in did I go off? Because that enabled God to take our sins and the condemnation from Adam and put all that on Jesus Christ. He paid for our sins. If it wasn't designed that way, and we were responsible for our own sins, how could God, uh, Christ die for him? Because if God holds us accountable and punishes us for our sins, he can't do the same to Christ. That would be the law of double jeopardy. It would not be fair, it would not be righteous, and it wouldn't be just. Yes? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. A lot of people would say, I'm going to explain what he said, that how can a loving God throw us into hell and condemn us for, uh, and send us to hell? Well, if you think it through, he didn't condemn us for hell, for, to, to hell. We condemn ourselves. God has done every single thing possible except for get, making us believe or programming us to believe. Everything that was possible, and there was a lot to make it available to us so that we could spend eternity with him and have a relationship with him simply by faith alone in Christ. And they condemn themselves because they reject Jesus Christ. Sin is not the issue in eternity. It is Jesus Christ and what you think of him. And that is going to determine where you're going to spend eternity, whether it's going to be in the lake of fire, spiritual death, eternally separated from God, or else you're going to believe in his son. That's when you receive the gift of eternal life. That so you receive the gift of God's own righteousness and a number of other things. That's all it takes. God gets all the glory because he did all the work. What else could he do? We, what, didn't we sing the song Sunday? What, do y'all remember with the song we sang Sunday? Uh, what else, what else could he do? Remember, what was, y'all remember the name of that song? You played it, Matthew. Is that the one that says, well, uh, what else could he do? Yeah, what more can he say than he, what, what he has said? And what more can he do than he's already done? He's done everything. And so it's just up to us. And yet man is so prideful and so manipulated by other people, not thinking for themselves that unfortunately the great masses um, will not accept the gift that God offers. So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For as though one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one many will be made righteous. Okay? that I said all that so you will understand why that was a present passive indicative. We fall because of Adam. And the best thing that God could do was condemn us for his sin. We fall under grace, and from that point on, all we have to do is believe the gospel. Okay, this was where we're starting tonight. That was just a little review. We're starting Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Being justified is a participle. It's an heiress passive participle. Heiress tense means something happened in a point of time. Snapshot. And the passive voice means, again, that we receive this. So in a point of time, those who believe in Jesus Christ receive justification from God. 
And notice, as a gift, justification is given as a gift. Eternal life is given as a gift. God's own righteousness is given as a gift. See, the hard part for God to give us these gifts is that someone had to pay for our sins. If, if Jesus Christ didn't go to the cross and God was giving us these gifts, could he be holy? Could he be righteous? Could he be just? No. But the fact that he can give these gifts demonstrates that God the Father was propitiated. He was satisfied with the work of Christ. Our condemnation Christ took. And now we all we have to do is accept this gift and we become children of God and will be with Jesus Christ in heaven forever. That's a deal, isn't it? The only thing is there's very little of that type of specifics in giving the gospel. Most people, well, you need to come to Christ. You need to... You need to cling to Jesus Christ. It's, it's just really pathetic. The first thing that we notice is that justification is a gift that is offered exclusively on the basis of God's grace. Only way. The last word you would ever find in that sentence or in this verse is works. And yet that's what most people in this on this planet are trying to do. They're trying to work. They're not trying to uh, accept a gift. They're trying to be justified by their works. Romans chapter 3, verse 20, combined with Romans 3, 24, puts a wooden spike through the heart of the notion that anyone can be justified by good works or anything of one's own merit. And here they are. I just took two verses. They're only ver four verses apart, both of them in Romans 3. You put those together and it's a double whammy. Because by the works of the law, this is Romans 3.20, by, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Never will and never have. Verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. As clear as it can. You know, we are in the heart of the gospel when we're in Romans chapter 3 and verse 4 and so forth. But this is, this is where it all is. The most important thing in the Bible, as far as I'm concerned, is the gospel. It's our way to be able to be justified before God and live with him for all eternity. And think of what the alternative is. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Okay, I'm going to turn this off a little bit. Justification is a legal term that indicates that there is a sufficient lawful reason for an act done. I'll read that again. Justification is a legal term that indicates there is a sufficient lawful reason for an act done. In other words, you're justified in an, something that you do. It's a legal term. Justification is a legal term that indicates that there is a sufficient lawful reason for an act done. The context of justification here is the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Of course, that's what it would be. I better put this on the board. It's kind of a long one. And justification is a legal term that indicates that there is a sufficient lawful reason for an act done. The context of justification here is the atoning work of Jesus Christ. In other words, if Jesus Christ had done his work on the cross, we would have no justification. That's what our justification is based on. And that justice of God regarding the redemption of man from the penalty of sin, which is spiritual death. And that's Genesis 2.17, which I've already alluded to earlier. 
It's amazing how many people don't even know, a lot of believers don't even know what is the penalty of sin. Well, the penalty of sin is spiritual death. And spiritual death means we have no relationship with God. And if that doesn't change, if we don't accept the redemption solution through Jesus Christ's work on the cross, then we will spend eternity in the lake of fire away from God for all eternity. Romans 5.1 puts it this way. Therefore, having been justified, notice the past tense of this, having been justified, that is a aorist, that's what the aorist tense does. It's a point in time in the past. And again, notice it's passive voice. Therefore, there was a point in time in the past where we were justified. It's something that we received from God by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When I think of having been saved, I can think of a lot of verses, but I always go back to John 3.36. For he who believes in the Son has eternal life. And no one receives eternal life unless they've already been justified. You see, the moment you have faith in Jesus Christ, bam, you are justified at that point right there. You receive the gift. You become a royal family member. And you'll be with God for all eternity. That's how important it is. Okay, we have a quote here. I don't want y'all to see the quote. Y'all gonna read ahead. Not all of you. This is from um, William McDonald, Believer Bible Commentary and author Farstad. This is what they say. A popular definition of justification is just as if I never sinned. Have y'all heard that before? But this does not go far enough. When God justifies the believing sinner, he not only acquits him from his guilt, but clothes him in his own righteousness and thus makes him absolutely fit for heaven. So justification goes beyond acquittal to approval and beyond a pardon to promotion. I guess y'all want to see that. I'm, I'm probably picking the wrong ones not to show. I'll read it one more time. A popular definition of justification is just as if I had never sinned. I've heard that in Sunday school. I don't know how many times. But this does not go far enough. When God justifies the believing sinner, he not only acquits him from guilt and clothes him with his own righteousness, is what, which is what takes place. And he, by the way, how does he get that righteousness? As a gift. When you believe in Jesus Christ, it's automatic in that instant. You are clothed with God's own righteousness because you've received the gift through faith. That's the only way to do it. And thus makes him absolutely fit for heaven. Justification goes beyond acquittal. You're not just acquitted for your sins. To approval. You could be acquitted for something and still not be approved. We go from acquittal to approval and beyond just a pardon to promotion. That's something else. I'll keep this one up here for you as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. God does not make the believer sinless or righteous in himself. Do you know what it means in himself? In other words, when we get God's righteousness imputed to us as a gift, it doesn't make us sinless or any more righteous than we already are in ourself. We are still our own still stinking thing, ourself. But we have the righteousness of God. When God sees us, he sees his righteousness. He blesses us because we have his righteousness. That's the grace pipeline. So he, rather, he credits righteousness to his account 
That's not capital H. That's our. He, he credits righteousness to our account. Justification is a reckoning that takes place in the mind of God. That's not the only place that matters, doesn't it? When we're justified, even though we do have God's own righteousness credited to our account, but I don't know that there's any real account up there that's going on, but in God's mind, that's what's taking place. Justification is a reckoning that takes place in the mind of God. When you put your faith alone in Christ alone, you are justified. In God's mind, you're justified. And when God's mind, you're justified. Here comes an avalanche of phenomenal blessings that we get that are permanent and they're given as a gift and we don't earn them and we don't deserve them. It's not something a believer feels. He knows it has taken in place because the Bible says so. I like that part. How do we know that all these things are so? Because the Bible says so. And if that's not good for good enough for somebody else, shame on them, not on you. In fact, you get a gold star. Anytime, well, why do you believe that? Because the Bible says so. And the Bible is the Word of God. It's infallible. It's alive and powerful. What are you talking about? And so this was C.I. Schofield expressed it this way. Justification is that act of God whereby he declares righteous all, those, all who believe in Jesus. Is that complicated? No. When you believe in Jesus, then he declares you righteous. Can he take that righteousness away? Does he want to? No. What if he did? No. Because the gift and calling of God are irrevocable, and these are gifts. It is something which takes place in the mind of God, not in the nervous system or emotional nature of the believer. And there's a lot of people out there that get mixed up, and they think it's their nervous system, it's their hormones, it's their emotion, it's all these things makes them feel like they're really saved. And it doesn't mean squat. Nothing. Doesn't matter. No matter how you feel. I can't even remember when I was saved. That's how much emotion I had. Of course I walked the aisle till it was they had to replace the car. Being justified as a gift by his grace. This phrase puts a double whammy on any suggestion that works are involved in being justified before God. A double whammy. Why? Because you have the word gift and you have the word grace. What does that have to do with works? Nada. Nothing. Zilch. If there has ever been anything that it is, that it is impossible to earn or deserve, it's a gift and grace. You don't get a gift because you deserve it. And you don't receive God's grace because you deserve it. This is, this is so, so phenomenal in just one phrase. Being justified as a gift by His grace. Try to wedge some kind of work in there and you'll, it doesn't work. People still stubbornly claim that they can be justified before God by their works when the Bible clearly says that justification is a gift from the grace of God. How, how more clear can it be? And I would guess that most of the people that you're going to come in contact with, and I'm not talking about your regular sphere of contact because probably you're like me and all the rest of us here, the sphere, sphere of your uh, life is embodied with the people at this church to a large degree. But outside of that sphere, most people that you're going to come in contact with are simply believing that they have to work for salvation, however they see it. A gift is freely given without any expectation or acceptance of payment. Isn't that true? When was the last time somebody gave you a gift 
and you said, well, uh, how much do I owe you? And what would really be jaw-dropping if they said, uh, 45 uh, 50 should do it. <laughs> $45.50, how about that? Okay, you just made a transaction. It's not a gift. Grace is unmerited favor which comes from the love and affection from another. That's what gifts are. They're based on love because you don't have to give a gift. And if you voluntarily give a gift, it's coming from your love and affection for the person that you're giving the gift to. And, you know, we need to all just forget about what the gift is. I'm not talking about, I'm not trying to minimize God's gift. I mean, that's, we'll never be able to even come close to, in any way, uh, earning that or anything. But when people give us gifts, give us gifts it's not the gift. Is it? What is so phenomenal is that they're saying, I love you. I have affection for you. And I have went to the trouble to, I've gone to the trouble to give this gift to you and offering it, hoping that you will take it in as a, a way I'm showing my love to you. That's what a gift is. And how many people say, Oh, what kind of gift is this? They don't, I, they know I don't like this. This is the wrong color. Now I have to take it back. Ooh, struck a nerve. <laughs> Forget about the gift. It's not about the gift. These days, when somebody goes to the trouble to sit down, well, first of all, either buy a card or make a card and then write all this, what you're feeling towards that person and good wishes and all this. And then you get an envelope and then you put the address on it and you get a stamp on it and you get the return address. And for me, it's about a football field to my mailbox. When I get a card from somebody, I really rush it. I really relish it. It's, it's because it's a lot. It's a lot of work to do something like that. I and I'm not trying to diminish emails. I like to get emails. They're nice too, but they're not on the same level as somebody either giving you a card or giving you a gift. Someone cooks you a meal. Wow. One of the problems we have in this country and have had for a long time is lack of gratitude. Justification by faith is actually more than subtraction of our sins, that is forgiveness. It is also the addition of the righteousness of Christ. Everybody thinks about, when they think about salvation, they think, oh, well, my, sin, my sins are taken care of. Whew, I'm so happy about that. And they think that's all it is. What about his righteousness that he gives you? We're not merely restored to Adam's former position, but now we are placed in Christ where we shall be throughout the endless ages of eternity, the sons of God. He just doesn't... Bring, he, when you believe the gospel and you're born again, you're born again into His family. You are a son or you are a daughter of God and will be for all eternity. And He chose it to be that way. The love of God. You can't even begin to understand how he would do that. It's not just taking away my sin. It's becoming one of his children. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 5 says the following. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. But God, being rich in mercy because of his what? Great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our, trans in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And this is three verses where that same phrase is going to be used again. 
from the very beginning. By grace you have been saved. That's Ephesians 2, 8. But we get a little preview right here in Ephesians 2, 5. See those first two words? How big are those first two words? But God. It doesn't matter what comes before that. It doesn't matter what happens into your life. All the hell you might be going through. But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loves us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. How did that happen? By grace, you, what? Have been saved. And all these people run around and don't know if they're saved or not. And you ask them, are you saved? And they say, I hope so. That is biblical ignorance speaking. And if they are a believer, shame on them. And they don't have the security and the peace of mind and the confidence and all the things that they should have to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ because they chose to be ignorant. they got too many things going on to worry about Bible study. Through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Let's go up to the verse again. I don't want to lose uh, where we are. Because of the works, uh, this is where I'm comparing Romans 3.20 with Romans 3.24. Because the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, being justified as a uh, as a gift by his grace. Now we're dealing with this last phrase here. Through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Redemption is Apollo Trosis. A P O L U T R O S S S I S. Apollotrosis. It's a noun, a genitive singular feminine, and it means buying back a slave or a captive. That is, making free by payment of a ransom. Redemption, acquittal. Also the state of being redeemed from transgressions. And then I have, by the way, that definition was from BDAG lexicon. That's the definition of the apolutrosis. And now we get into the English dictionary. Redeem is a transitive verb. One, it means to buy back. That's A. B is to get or win back. Get something back that was lost. Two, to free from what distresses or harms. To free someone from something that is distressing them or harming them as, and we got A, B, C, D here, A, to free from captivity by payment of ransom. That would fit if someone came in, stole your child and you wanted them back and you were going to free them by paying a ransom? B, to extricate from our help to overcome something detrimental. C, to release from blame our debt, meaning to clear someone. And D, to free from the consequences of sin. And this is from the Webster Dictionary. This is an old dictionary. Still has that definition in it as well. The imagery behind this Greek word, that is redemption, comes from the ancient slave market. It meant paying the necessary ransom to obtain the prisoner or slave's release. The only adequate payment to redeem sinners from the sin slavery and its deserved punishment was in Christ Jesus and was paid to God to satisfy his justice. 
Again, simply put, I think, uh, I think in terms of this, you've heard of the slave market of sin. By the way, that's still going on places in the world today. And when Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross and God the Father accepted that payment, it was, it was as if we are in a slave market and in prison, and when that happened, the prison door just flung open. People are not in prison to slavery in the slave market of sin because the door is locked. It's open now. All they have to do is walk out. Most of them don't because they don't believe that if they walk out, they'll truly be safe. You think it might be a trick or something. So all these people, see, they're not going to hell for their sins. While they're over here trying to work to impress God so they can be justified by their works, which will never happen, all they have to do is walk out. If a, if a, a guard came up to them and here they are, they're in, in jail and the door is open, the, jail, the, the guard said, I don't know why you're still in there. All you have to do is walk out. It's, it's, the door is open. You're free to do it. Just do it. How crazy is it for them to stay in the slave market of sin? And it's, that's exactly what people are doing who are trying to be justified by their own works. They're staying in the prison cell when the door is open. Here's a few verses for you. It has to do with uh, redeem. 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, and it is not Mary. The man, Christ Jesus. He had to be a man to be a mediator who gave himself as a ransom for who? All. The testimony born at the proper time. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with, imper with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. Verse 19. But with the precious blood as a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Now, let me see, we're going to see this word a lot or this phrase a lot, the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ has nothing whatsoever to do with his physical blood. It is a, more or less a metaphor for the spiritual death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's what the blood of Christ is referring to. The spiritual death of Christ on the cross. Of course, all these animals, the life of the blood was in the animals and when they would kill the animal, they would take the blood and they would put it uh, on, you know, it would go from the altar, <coughs> excuse me, and be sprinkled sometimes on the people, sometimes on the altar, sometimes on the Holy of Holies. But the whole point was, it was a representation of where the true Lamb of God would come in and make the sacrifice. The only one that could make that sacrifice which was his spiritual death on the cross. That was what we saw in Genesis 2.17. He told Adam, the day that you eat this, you shall surely die. And he died. And what happened when he, was, when he died spiritually? He, he got away from God. He no longer had a relationship with God. He was just consumed with mental attitude and sins, which he never even had one before. Can you imagine how confused they were? I mean, the, the Fear. Anger, hostility, all the things that just came upon him. And in God's grace, he pursued him and asked him, where are you, Adam? Hebrews 9.12 Not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his blood, his sacrifice, his spiritual death on the cross. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now this is a, a takeoff on the high priest would go in one time a year on the Day of Atonement, and he would go in with blood, 
See, when the animals were being sacrificed, it was the blood that as close as they could come to as Christ, for Christ's spiritual death. They don't have a spirit. But they would take that blood that they died and the, the high priest would sprinkle it on the mercy seat of the, and this is in the Holy of Holies, and they, that would obtain a, a eternal redemption. Only that, that didn't. They were only good for one year. The next year the priest had to go in there, the high priest would go in there and do it over and over again. And that was for the unknown sins of the people. And if, every, if he did everything right and God accepted that atonement with the blood being poured out, then they could be another year. And here we, but this is saying, not through the blood of goats and calves. He says it's not through those animal sacrifices and their blood. Is, is, that's not what redeemed you. But through his own blood, he entered the holy place once, one time. He didn't have to keep doing it on the altars of the Catholic churches and so forth. Once for all, having obtained, look at this, eternal redemption. How can someone lose their, re, their salvation if they have eternal redemption? Ephesians 1, seven. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And unfortunately, there's so many people when they read, like, let's say, verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, they don't read any further. They think, oh, the blood. And they sing uh, nothing but the blood. And there, I was in the Baptist church and we sang some, <laughs> what is that one that's so bad? Uh, washed in the blood, that's it. And there was a fount but, Filled with blood that drawn from Emmanuel's veins. That is a crock. Where do they find that in the Bible? It's not there. And they think that it's his literal blood that it that saved. Actually, there was very little blood because these were pierced. It wasn't cutting. The nail, nails went in and in his feet. And you know, when you have a pierce, it bleeds a little bit, but not. Not not that much blood, and we know that for sure that he didn't bleed that much because when the Roman came and put the spear into his side, it said blood and serum came out because it, it hadn't spilled out. There wasn't blood everywhere. Of course, he already uh, was whipped in his back. Now, that was bloody. But that shows that uh, he, was, he did not bleed to death because he still had all this uh, blood in him. I think it's, is it autolysis is the term when your blood turns to serum and then that's, that's what they saw. It wasn't water, it was blood serum. Okay, I don't have enough time to read Hebrews chapter 10 verse 3 through 4 and so we'll start right here with Hebrews chapter 10 verse 3 through 4 and then we're going into uh, verse 35. Oh, excuse me, 25. Romans 3 25 next time. Any questions? Don't forget that uh, this Friday is Friday fun night and you're all invited. Let's close. Heavenly Father, what a pleasure, pleasure and privilege it is to see these dogmatic statements in your word that gives us complete confidence and security and peace of mind. It doesn't have to do with anything about how we feel. We don't have to go back in our minds when we believe the gospel. Was it really a true belief? Was there enough belief? It was the quality of the belief. It doesn't have anything to do with it. It all has to do with the object of our faith, which is Jesus Christ. And there is no percentage there is no amount given in the bible of how pure or how much faith we have because it doesn't matter an infinitesimal amount of faith in jesus christ means that we are instantly justified before you by grace that justification is a gift eternal life is a gift your own righteousness is a gift 
So we pray that you will help us to understand these things and be bold and be audacious in spreading the news, the good word, the good news that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. And by faith alone in Jesus Christ, you can, you can become a member of his family and live eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you will help us think about these things and be at the ready when we have an opportunity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.